You're listening to a Rock Candy podcast. For the best audio experience and to avoid embarrassment, we strongly suggest you use headphones whilst listening to Bubble and Squeak. Hi, I'm Peter Santoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories, most weird, many true. Okay, here's season two, episode one. Our show today comes in three parts. Part one, writer and filmmaker Kristen Peterson Kazubowski talks about her first feature-length film, Ringo Livio. Part two, we hear excerpts from her film. And part three, a personal story wrapped in a sound slice. During the pandemic, many of us have had time to think about and revisit the past. We reconnected to people and places virtually, in our minds, and in some cases, in the flesh. In her first feature-length film, Kristen Peterson Kazubowski experienced her recent past. Ringo Livio explores the discomfort she feels when she is so often thrust into hyper-masculine places. The film tells the story of two women in a relationship. Marissa is an outgoing singer-songwriter struggling to assert new sides of herself. She brings her introverted, insect-loving girlfriend Ada to rural Wisconsin to meet the family. The visible tension in the film is between Marissa's loud, childish adult brothers and this quiet, sensitive Ada. Ada tries hard to fit in. She mostly doesn't. The other quieter tension is within Marissa herself. She becomes the central character as the others satellite around her. I recently chatted with Kazubowski. She talks about the film, the insects in it that still creep her out, and the need to push queer cinema to embrace everyday human experiences. I'm Kristen Peterson Kazubowski. I would say I'm first a screenwriter, then a director, then a producer. But I I spend most of my days writing poetry. I've been working on Ringo Livio as a concept, as a a collection of poems, kind of. Impressions of my young 18, 19, 20-year-old life. I I got a lot of help from really talented screenwriters who have written longer pieces, narratives, to help me kind of form, well, how am I telling the story of one person or one weekend? But I, I have written some really unsuccessful screenplays before this that were just murky. And this was the first project where I felt like, oh, I I am telling the story of an experience. There was so much clarity around it. And also keeping that tone that I've, I've really admired about independent film work. Everything is autobiographical for sure. Even in discussions with people I've made this movie with, hundreds of hours of talking about the characters, everyone says, I'm Marissa. And I'm like, I'm not Marissa. She comes off very bubbly, maybe, or warm or erratic. (laughs) And maybe that is how people perceive me. But I've always felt more like I am definitely Ada, where internally, I always feel like I'm searching for a connection I've never had. The Ada that I wrote, that is me, is how I felt around some friend groups growing up. And that's where the brothers come in. Like the brothers are definitely, they are 25 different people pushing to three different brothers. But then I also see myself in each of them. And I think that's, that's important to do when you're writing characters who you don't necessarily want to be. You still have to humanize them. It's important that it's two women in a space. There's the... I say very Midwestern, but to open it up, the subconscious language or cues when you're in a space with a lot of men who greet you by showing you their butts. Like I really needed to show how one woman would respond to it who grew up with it and she seems okay with it. Maybe not internally and maybe maybe it'll take a few years for her to like start fighting back. And then I wanted to show someone who didn't grow up in it at all, who off the bat, is not comfortable with the brother 
I just think this is language that brothers have that I've I've seen a lot of. It's what's the best word for this? It's competitive. And if you don't fit a mold or you don't play along or you don't laugh at the jokes, then the mood just deflates. So it is absolutely important to me that it's two women in a relationship going into the space where they're not a part of the language. But Marissa chooses to play along and Ada just struggles the entire movie to play along. In my younger 20s, I felt like I've always been attracted to or plummeted into hypermasculine areas, especially filmmaking. When I was in college, I was the only female, <laughs> even just like making independent films, I was really the only female on set. That's probably another reason that this story came out. Why am I the feminine energy person in these like sports arenas or filmmaking or music? And why do I feel so excluded? Or why do I want to be in these spaces? Why am I not allowed in these spaces? The bugs were added really late into the screenplay. I felt like Ada, because she is so excluded and it's and her character is so internal, she doesn't say or necessarily show what she's feeling all the time. I felt like there had to be a visual metaphor for how she treated Marissa, her girlfriend. I should say, first of all, I hate bugs. Bugs really bother me, even ladybugs. That was another interesting element. It's like I'm writing these little characters into the story, but I have this negative association with them to begin with. But I felt like that was a good thing for me as a writer. It's like, well, where am I going to find compassion or appreciation for these insects? Especially the praying mantis. It still really bothers me when it's eating the cricket near the end of the movie. That's, oh, I hate that image. It really bothers me to see violence without fur. There's something about a furry animal where I'm just like a little, it's easier for me to digest. What can you do with a bug after you catch it? There's not much you can do other than keep it and look at it and keep it from its natural environment. And I felt that was so inherently cruel. I perceive that in a lot of relationships around me, the unhealthy ones, not to be too judgmental, but I just feel like people, sometimes they find someone in their life that they're so attracted to that they just want to hold on to them and keep them. But in doing that, they don't allow that person to be anything else at all. They are that pretty interesting thing that they're the, they're containing. And near the end of the film, Ada literally lets the praying mantis go. And I wanted that to show that she realized I can't keep Marissa in this box. And we probably shouldn't be in the same box together at all. She's trying to open Marissa up or the praying mantis up to do what they would do naturally. And if they stay, they stay. And it, I don't want it to be too clear near the end, but Marissa's not going to stay if she's not contained. Queer cinema has been so important for me, especially coming from Wisconsin and most of cinema is straight couples. So seeing movies about coming out, especially as teenagers or young people coming out and dealing with that, it's so important to me to see that on the screen. Where are those movies where things aren't clicking? Or where are those movies where the family doesn't like you, not because you're gay, but because you don't fit in or you're just like, you're not as funny as them. I want a hundred more of those. I also want to see more breakup movies. I want to see how gay people have those conversations. Or in the case of Ring Olivio, they don't necessarily have the conversation, which is my experience a lot in the past is breakups are have always been so wordless and confusing, but emotionally clear. We need more queer characters not necessarily coming out or facing parental figures who are against the idea of you dating a similar sexed person. Actually, the, the praying mantis was a wonderful actor. He did a lot of really great things for us. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, this doesn't crash in. No. It doesn't. Why did you... Were you wanting it to do that? Never. Hi, Anne. Hi. See if we can, like, squeeze messages to each other. Rescue me <laughs> from this place. <laughs> the SOS. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I'll save you. <laughs> Just tear me out for once. Wait, do you even get the game? Because we have to win, we can't lose, so you have to get the game. Pretty sure. I mean, catch them, don't get caught. Yeah, uh, yeah she gets yeah. it. Let me set the scene for you. It's October 6, 2020. It's exactly 30 years from the day I married a woman, my best friend, at the church we attended in New York City. She knew I was gay before we got married, but we believe that through Christ all things are possible. After five years of marriage with lots of ups and downs, the marriage finally imploded. And since that time, I've been lugging around a box. A box of memories, photos, letters, notes, legal documents. As I was clearing out the attic, getting ready to move to South Africa with my husband, Glenn, I came across this dreaded box. And I knew it was time. So that night, I visited my friend Alex. And on October 6, 2020, around a fire in his backyard, one by one, I put the items on the fire. Bubble and Squeak is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. I mostly make the show for me, and for my friend Liz. These days, she's been digging through her own past. The Bubble and Squeak theme song is Worthless by the Jelly Rocks from the Bang and Whimper album. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to music. You also heard Moody One and Vape Juice. They were composed by Scott Carey, who helms Brat Sounds. Learn more about the film Ringo Livio, see trailers, still photos, and more. Just visit RingoLivioFilm.com. To find more great music and new podcasts, visit RockCandyRecordings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hi to me on Twitter at p 2 The letter P, the number two, S-O-N. Oh, and thanks for listening. I'm Erica Michelle. I host a voice diary called Brown Sugar Diaries on the Rock Candy Network, where I spill all the tea about my dating experiences, life lessons, my journey to healing and wholeness, my life as an entrepreneur, student doctor, CEO of a nonprofit, and I give my opinion on the current happenings of the world. You see why I have this voice diary? I got a lot of stuff to talk about. Tune into Brown Sugar Diaries wherever you listen to podcasts and let's sip on this tea or wine. You'll cup your business sugar, okay? <laughs>